Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Being Muslim with me, Oli Noor. Last week we spoke a little bit about um, the idea of loneliness and one of the points about loneliness was where Sister Saida mentioned that people who are uh, hard of hearing, especially the elderly, find it very hard to communicate. And this idea of communication, it is very, um, it's a very human element that we as all human beings uh, take for granted, uh, yearn for, and it is something that we don't even think about uh, um, uh, very often. So we have today with us a special guest to speak about the uh, topic of deafness and uh, hearing impairment, uh, Brother Azad Hussain. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sorry, I uh, couldn't hear that. Um, sorry, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Okay, Jazakallah khair for accepting our invitation. Um, I want, I, one of the reasons why I invited you to the show to speak about this is because um, deafness, it's something that we see in uh, probably media a lot more recently um, and it's something that I, in my, in my personal uh, experience, I haven't seen the community, uh, the Bangladeshi community or the Muslim community really uh, offer much uh, assistance or help within this um, uh, for, for those who are deaf or hearing impaired. And uh, mashallah, I've seen um, probably j from East London Mosque um, uh, every Friday Jum'ah, uh, obviously before COVID, where they had a deaf interpreter um, and they even uh, had facilities for that. And so I wanted to invite you to, uh, to the show to speak, uh, introduce yourself a little bit uh, why I brought you to the show, uh, and uh, if, if you can uh, speak a little bit about yourself, and then uh, we'll jump straight into it, inshallah. Sure. So um, I'm the head of operations with Ali Shara. Um, mm. Ali Shara uh, are a deaf services organization. We focus on making Islam accessible to the deaf. Mm. Um, so Ali Shara are actually the organization that operate within the London Muslim, Muslim Center and East London Mosque, and we're the organization that actually provides interpreting for the purpose. Mm. Um, so I'm the head of operations, as mentioned there. I'm also uh, the project manager for the BSL Quran translation project, which is um, a groundbreaking breaking, mm. uh, epic project in which we're translating the Quran into uh, sign language, British mm. sign language picture. So it's a visual representation of the words of Allah. Oh, so BSL is British Sign Language, just for our audience's reference. Yes, yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. BSL. So I personally, um, though, though I have a friend uh, who is deaf, I would like to call him a friend, and um, I haven't really seen much myself uh, about the deaf community and the obstacles they uh, have. But before we speak about that, what is deafness exactly? And I use the word hearing impairment. Um, this is just, uh, from my knowledge, as, as something that is added with the deafness. But if you can explain what that is exactly, uh, are people born with it, uh, does it develop, um, etc. Sure. Mm. Um, so, the deaf community with the capital D um, mm. are people who self-identify as people who are deaf. And usually they uh, are people who are profoundly deaf. Um, the medical term deaf is usually with a lowercase d and it refers to a loss of hearing and that loss of hearing has a degrees of losses so for example somebody who has a really uh, like they can hear a minimal amount or absolutely nothing they may be described as profoundly deaf um, then you'll have somebody who has a little bit more hearing they may be severely deaf and then you have moderately deaf and then you have mildly deaf and all of these things um, have a impact on you and how you communicate. So somebody, for example, who may be uh, hard of hearing, in a, in, in, is that has some kind of hearing loss, uh, may not identify themselves as being full on deaf. And that person is very unlikely to use sign language, whereas somebody who identifies themselves with a capital D and, and is profoundly deaf will inevitably use uh, some form of 
um, visual communication like sign language. Um, deafness, are you born with it? You can be born with it. You, it can occur later on in life. Um, it can occur at old age, as with many of people it does. Um, mm -hmm. But generally, it can happen in multi multiple uh, number of ways. Um, but yeah. Okay, so it's uh, quite an interesting thing for uh, just to think about uh, when it develops because um, the idea of uh, having heard, uh, ha having been able to communicate through hearing and then that being taken away and we're reminded that, uh, in the Quran that uh, we are blessed with many things and that everything is a ni'mah and that we are to uh, take care and be thankful for the ni'mas, uh, for, the, for the blessings that we have. And so it sometimes plays on my mind uh, the idea of how would I be if I lost my hearing? Uh, how would I be able to communicate? And so I wanted to uh, ask you this question. How important is communication for those who have, uh, both in the case of being born with uh, deaf, uh, maybe with a capital D, uh, and, and those who uh, were, fun uh, were, were fully able to hear and they developed a hearing loss um, later on in life. Um, and and if, if you can expand on that, please. Um, how important is communication? That's a really good question. I think communication is um, inherent to our humanity, right? Mm. Um, everything that we need to do in life, ultimately, we do with some form of communication or another. Um, and not being able okay. to communicate, um, I mean... Sorry to disturb, um, we have a caller who's called into the studio. Yeah. Uh, we'll pick this up uh, shortly after that, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa caller. Hello, wa alaikum salam bhai. I'm not great between our family, Sudhu Matram. I'm not great between our scientists, and our old age, and our children, 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 এটা সাইন্টিস্টে যেহেতু জানে আমরা প্রথম দিকে আমরা কুরআন মানবো এবং বাচ্চা নেওয়ার পূর্বে আমরা জিপির ওয়ার্ডার নিব তাহলে একটা বালা একটা পরিবার গড়তে পারবো ভবিষ্যতের জন্য মাস বি কুরআন অনুযায়ী সালাম আলাইকুম ওয়ালাইকুম in an age of um, modern medicine, mm. our mm. doctors can effectively tell us if our children are going to be born deaf or mm. if they are going to have some kind of deficiency. Maybe that is the case with some people, and otherwise, sometimes it's not the case. Like I said, some people develop deafness later on as a result of something that happens in their life. Um, you know, it could be because of an infection, it could be because of something else. Um, some people have deaf parents. Um, they may have a defective gene, and basically that's why, you know, they're born as a deaf person. Mm. Not to say being born with deafness, there is something necessarily wrong with them, and deaf people certainly mm. don't see it that way. Um, so deaf people are a part of society, inevitably, mm. and obviously communication needs to be facilitated for them. We have large numbers of deaf people, and deafness is one of the probably, I, th I believe deafness is the second biggest disability of the world. So in the UK right now, the figures are one in six people have some form of deafness. That could be profound deafness all the way to mild deafness. Mm. Now, these people, of course, as you've said, communication is inherently linked to our humanity. We need to be able to say, I want to eat, I want to sleep, uh, I want to do this, and also, beyond just the major physiological need what about the mental and emotional needs doesn't a person need to express their love doesn't don't they need to express their longings their mm. aspirations their dreams or just to be able to communicate we as human beings are sociable creatures we mm. need to be able to communicate uh, and sometimes because of uh, these issues having the inability to communicate uh, deaf people are often isolated as you mentioned um mm. And isolation doesn't mean that you are not um, with a number of people. You yes. could be amidst the largest of crowds and still mm. be isolated because you can't connect with them. 
So communication, I would say, it's it's vital to living, really. Yeah. And it's something that needs to be there for their people. Mm. And and this is actually something that we explored last week when we had a uh, a counsellor on speaking about loneliness and the idea of um, even being surrounded by people yet internally feeling alone. And I think um, th th this can be... I can really appreciate how uh, this may be magnified even more uh, within the uh, deaf community. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, how has it? The, uh, how was it that sign language developed as a uh, means of communication for those uh, who are uh, uh, from the deaf community? Has it always been around? Um, uh, or, or has the, the lack of um, sign language been a, uh, um, a detriment even to uh, people uh, uh, from the deaf community? That's really good, interesting questions you have there. Um, so, again, uh, signing, gesturing, communicating, um, as far as we know, or as mm. far as we perceive, sign language has been around as long as there have been deaf people because there would always have been an inherent need to communicate in some way, whatever it is a, a deaf person requires. Mm. Um, so we know, for example, like the, uh, from the Native Americans and there's markings, the archeological findings that they, they, they've sort of come across to say, oh, there's proof of sign language here in this form or that form, uh, whether it's the Native Americans, whether it's, um, uh, a caveman or whoever it is in various uh, societies, various communities in history have been mm. documented to use some form of sign or another. Even the, the Indian dancers, the mudras, I believe they call them, they used to communicate through a form of sign language. In Europe, you also had uh, monks who would take a vow of silence. Now they've taken a vow of silence, but nevertheless, they still need to communicate. Um, mm. And they also developed this kind of gestural system. Um, However, sign language, in the way that we understand it now, how it's developed now, mm. um, has had a specific part. So, for example, British sign language um, developed in the 18th century, as we know it now. Uh, and that was because a man named Thomas Braidwood decided to set up a school for uh, parents of deaf children who are wealthy and say, right, well, we're going to try to educate you through um sign language and through hmm. oral methods and you know and that's how it eventually became standardized but however in british history because hmm. sign language isn't a written language there there isn't a lot of documentation to support exactly when how where it started but however if there are traces to, to go far as back as the 16th century to show that there have been um marriages that have taken place vows that mm. have taken place through sign language but as we know british sign language language now um it's developed in a history a, a back against the background of oppression upon deaf mm. people um because again in the uh, i believe 19th century they tried to ban sign language um but it's against that backdrop that slowly mm. slowly now it has developed and since the 1980s British Sign Language has been broadcasted on uh, UK television as well, and that's obviously helped further excel it. Okay, so the idea of um, British Sign Language, we say British Sign Language, are there um, uh, other uh, sign languages? Um, for example, um, I know America has one that they call ASL. Is, is it profoundly right. different or is it... Uh, when it comes to languages, because we hear language, we speak language, we can hear differences. Uh, but uh, for the most part, mm -hmm. I think because most people are uh, do not know sign language, are there um, large differences between uh, the, the different international sign languages? Um, so again, um, language and culture are inherently mm -hmm. linked. Okay. And in very much the same way, there are differences between cultures there are differences in language. And I'll demonstrate yeah. that point to you. So for example, um, one of the things that sign language includes is our gestures, right? Mm. Hand gestures. Um, from, 
uh, if you were to imagine an Arab saying patience or gesturing patience or, or expressing that through body language in one sh way, shape or form, how would you imagine an Arab would say patience? Um, honestly, I, <laughs> um, it's, it's a strange uh, thought experiment, but um, uh, probably quite pronounced, uh, probably using both hands, like, um, I don't know, some sort of... Uh, <laughs> it's a good, it's a good guess, sort but of... I don't know if you've ever... Definitely, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but I don't know if you've mm. ever seen this, like, Arabs, they're like, Sabor, you know, patience. Yes. <laughs> have you seen that gesture? Yes, I have. You know? Mm. So, again, that's linked with their culture. That's how they would signify patience. Come on, have some patience. Whereas in British Sign Language, it's more like patience, you know? So mm. it, things have uh, a uh, etymology, etymological link. Signs, have, signs represent things and are visual representation of, representations of things. Mm. So undoubtedly, each culture has a different uh, perspective on what things are. And that's why mm. visually they will be largely different a lot of one of the things that deaf people have a, a running joke about is all, all the hearing people will say is deaf if, if sign language same ac all across the world and uh amongst the deaf community they have this joke about them and they'll say are spoken languages same all across the world because hearing people tend to say oh it's a shame that it's, sign language isn't the same if it was the same you'd all be able to understand each other well that's all the same applies for a spoken language as well so, yeah, just an interesting fact. But language and um, culture are inherently linked, and for those reasons, mm. there are uh, variations. Um, there are British Sign Language, however, and variants of it are used in other parts of the world. So, mm. for example, Australia and New Zealand, they use a very close variant. American Sign Language has a history of French influence. So French Sign Language influenced um, uh, American Sign Language more. Okay. The, um, I'm guessing that's because of the historical um, French colonial, uh, colonialization of parts of uh, America. Uh, and, and so they probably inherited uh, some of that culture as well. Uh, it's more to do with um, the influence that within the academic circles of deaf people. So, okay. so uh, there was a man... There's a, there's Sorry, sorry to uh, jump in. Um, well, no, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Um, we're just going to take a short pause and come back straight to this uh, uh, this conversation uh, shortly after the break. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Being Muslim with me, Oli Noor. Uh, just before the break, we had our guest uh, Azad Hussein, um, who uh, is from Al Ishara Trust, speak a little bit about um, deafness. And we were in the middle of our conversation about the cultural impact that, um, that comes into the language. So, uh, welcome back, uh, Brother Azad. Um, I just wanted to Thank ask you. another question about the idea of uh, lip reading. Um, how is, is lip reading something that is common or is it uh, only very uh, skilled people that are able to do so? Um, lip reading, when you say um, mm. lip reading, um, lip reading is something deaf people do as a mm. part of generic communication in conjunction with sign language usually. Um, mm. We usually lip reading isn't a accurate way of communicating um, unless you already already know a good degree of context. Mm. So generally, when we communicate in sign language, we use yes. a combination of uh, ha hand shapes, signs, mm. movements, facial expressions, as well as uh, lip patterns. Those lip okay. patterns. Uh, mm. Maybe English or they may be sign language, and they can be read by other people that you're communicating mm. with. 
but however they're a bit exclusive lip reading some sometimes people have this notion that there could be somebody who could be looking at you from a v- far and they could just tell what you're saying without any uh, uh without sufficient context and in mm. reality it's actually, actually um extremely difficult to do because there are lip patterns that we have that we use um which are saying completely different things but mm. have exactly the same lip pattern um as an example if i mm. was to say i love you mm. uh, has the same lip pattern as mm. the second the second uh, thing that i said was elephant juice and this is what something they have a, a common mm. thing with i mean they they have no correlation but yeah. the lip patterns look the same mm. so just to prove the point that yeah. lip pattern is not uh lip reading is not an effective mm. way of necessarily communicating without it being in conjunction with mm. um other means of communication okay so so it's it's, it's more like a set of um uh, secondary uh, uh no not communication but um just uh, as an additional tool to the communication within the sign language itself that's right yeah so okay. um some people do reuse lip reading uh, mm. t- uh to get their cues of what is being said mm. uh, but again requires a good amount of um uh context mm. uh, i only ask this question because uh, i do uh, know a few uh, people that are uh let's use the word paranoid <laughs> uh, about um uh, certain uh, issues and uh, this is something that uh, they they'll be curious about so I thought I'd just put that in there as a fun little question sure. but to get to the more serious matter um when it comes mm-hmm. to um uh, the obstacles that people face Uh, and 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 there are many obstacles that that uh, people whether it is a complete deafness or a se- severing uh, severe hearing loss uh, people can face within the community i want to focus in on what uh, muslim uh, muslims may face uh, that come from uh, the deaf community um so again it's it, it's really difficult um f- especially for muslims who are deaf because um unfortunately within uh, our communities or within migrant communities per se um there is a specific stigma attached to deaf so when for example a deaf child is born 90% mm. of deaf deaf children are born to hearing parents a lot of the times the reaction is one of like sort of devastation or like oh my gosh how is my child going to have a normal life how are they going to access islam how are they going to get married these these kind of things and mm. sometimes there is a a heavy stigma attached to deaf people and that kind that can impede them mm. um many of the muslims that are in, within the uk sometimes again uh when you're talking about first generation parents who have migrated sometimes they don't have english and for yes. them to learn bsl is a further stretch so there are cases where we find there are deaf people who are who have uh muslim families and so on and so forth but unfortunately they very they're very isolated even within their households so the communication mm. between parent and child may be as basic as gestural communication such as like you know eat sleep that kind of communication which obviously isn't necessarily sufficient mm. um and then we have the whole range of um access issues so we're talking about access to religious services uh how does a deaf person go into the masjid how does he listen to a khutbah how does he pray what does he recite in his prayer um what is being said in the quran how does he understand this how mm. does he as a person who's growing up in a muslim household how does he connect with allah uh how can do you see what i'm trying to say uh, yeah. so a lot of the times we find deaf muslim people who are born in deaf muslims who are born into muslim households sadly mm. at a later age they often abandon islam because they simply haven't had access to it or can't understand it and sometimes the religious and cultural constraints there are they kind of enforced on a person mm. to say right this is what you have to follow but they don't really understand why they have to follow it it's never been explained to them these are some of the difficulties that occur. and then obviously there are other issues uh when it comes to things like marriage employment um you know 
over communication within the deaf, uh, within the Muslim deaf community of uh, isn't so great, which is one of the reasons that Ali Shara also offers sign language uh, courses. Mm. Subhanallah, it's it's quite um, I guess uh, quite disheartening to hear the obstacles that um, uh, that the uh, Muslims from the deaf community can face, and and um, it's something that I, I personally didn't even think about. Um, I, I tend to do a lot of thinking, uh, but um, to to mm -hmm. think that um, because of the lack of communication and e even the fact that coming from migrant families, there, there's the additional, not even English as the base, but. Uh, uh, um, um, wh whether that's a uh, Bengali or some other language, and and, and to to understand the, the, the to to see this barrier, it's quite um, uh, disheartening, and, and right. to also understand that uh, because of this barrier and and the cultural upbringing, um, some uh, in fact uh, leave is Islam. So. Um, and, and you mentioned the idea of uh, going to the masjid, what, the, what that looks like, um, how would they recite the mm -hmm. Qur'an. Uh, and at the beginning of the program, you mentioned that you were uh, working on a project for, uh, in regards to BSL and Qur'an recitation. Um, please do refresh my memory on what that is. And if you can also explain no. what recitation of the Qur'an does look like for a person uh, from the deaf community. Sure. So um, yeah, as mentioned, um, in the, in very much the same way, we need access to the Quran to be able to practice mm -hmm. our faith. Obviously, the Quran is the primary source of our religion. Now, we understand that we need access to that. Uh, mm -hmm. In the in very much the same way, deaf people need access to the Quran. The first language of the British deaf community, profoundly deaf community, is not English in the UK. It is British Sign Language. Uh, their cognitive processes are different to a hearing person's. They process things visually, whereas we may process things on a word-by-word -word basis. So deaf people need access to the Qur'an, and it needs to be in the language that they also understand. So one of the things, for example, that a person may need access to the Qur'an for is how we, for example, when we're in Salah, we mm. can recite Surah Fatiha, right? And yeah. we may, if we're, if it's a quiet prayer, we may just move our tongue. Now, how does a deaf person recite that? Or, I mean, for him, the movement of the tongue doesn't really mean anything because there's no sound associated, there's no meaning associated, there's no prayer associated. Mm. Um, so he needs something in meaning equivalent so he can pray. Otherwise, he's literally just standing there like a conduit, you know, like a... A, a, a robot effectively mm. mimicking actions which doesn't have an effect on his spirituality his faith um so for those reasons we've actually firstly we've we've had a number of services that are trying to address these things um and secondly we've started to uh, translate the quran into a visual language so the quran is being translated into british sign language okay to do that we have a host of um people that are employed in this project so we have a, a translator we have a deaf consultant we have a, a sheikh we have an arabic linguist um and we basically go through the quran and then try make provisional translations once those translations are done we record them because they are effectively signs hmm. of whatever the verses are when those drafts are made we've provide them to a deaf focus group who check this. We then have it rechecked by an independent translator. And then that again checked by a uh, sheikh, a senior sheikh. Usually at the moment, one of our patron sheikhs, mashallah, is Sheikh Abdul from the uh, East London Masjid, mm. who's been a long standing supporter of the deaf community, alhamdulillah. Um, and then that gets approved. Once that gets approved, we go through a film a process of filming um, and editing and then publishing uh, and making that available to the deaf community, who can mm. now then take this material, look at it, understand it, and implement it in their prayer. That doesn't mean to say a deaf person will stand in salah and do sign language. However, mm. he will have memorized Surah Fatiha in the same way we would have memorized it. But whilst we may be moving our tongue, he is having the visualizations of what, of what, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Mm. So you ask me, for example, what does a sign language verse look like? So as an mm. example, um, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. 
Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, as an example. Mm. Um, so these are, and these have specific meanings. So for example, this is praise Allah, the Lord of everything. Mm. Most, most merciful, most gracious. But these have, these signs have meaning attached. When a deaf person sees them, they understand them. They understand mm. them. So just, just, um, as we, but yeah. just, just as we hear the words um, in our native language, uh, which uh, for me, English is my uh, first language uh, or primary language. language. Um, and and uh, when we hear uh, the most merciful, uh, the most beneficent or, or the ever merciful, uh, the same way, I guess they would be, vis the same way that we think about this, uh, they would uh, yes. think about it from the, uh, receiving it visually, uh, if that makes sense. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly what it is. That's exactly mm. what it is. Um, and we've realized that there is a specific need for this because in the past, mm. there ha in as I mentioned before, that deaf people have sort of uh, gone through the education system against a backdrop of uh, oppression that's been on them. In mm. the past, there's, there's been occasions when um, there have been conferences that have tried to ban ban sign language around the world. So in the 1880s, there was a conference known as the Second International Conference for the Deaf and Dumb, not a term that we use anymore. But, um, that's what the name of the conference was. And they effectively said um, oral communication was superior than sign communication. And they tried to start sign, ban sign language all around the world to force deaf people to try and read and write. It's they did this for a while. Mm. And they realized that actually, yeah, deaf people can read, but and they can try and mimic sounds that you ask them to mimic. However, mm. they they did not they they didn't develop. They didn't learn, and that wasn't because of a mental impediment. But it was because mm. um, they their cognitive processes are different to us. So, for example, one of the things that is argued that is, what drives our thinking process is our inner voice. When we think, we may hear our inner voice in our head. Mm. If a deaf person doesn't have a voice, what do they hear? How, what drives their thinking process? And actually, it's visualizations. So in very much the same way, we may be able to read letters of English mm. uh, in a foreign language and not understand them. That's effectively what was happening to deaf people. Okay. So, if that, if that makes sense. I think it does. Um, and it, it sounds a bit, uh, it reminds me of the eugenics movements that, that was happening, um, you know, in, in some parts of the world, uh, probably around the same mm. time, give or take. So um, yeah. the idea that British Sign Language is, uh, or Sign Language in general, is, is a first language, does that mean that when they read the translations uh, in English, it's as if they are reading a foreign language? Um, it, it depends on the person, but generally mm. speaking, the average age of a deaf person, uh, a deaf school leaver, uh, the average uh, literacy age is nine years old. Mm. So English certainly isn't their first language. Um, okay. Just to go back to that example, it's like, imagine you can read something. It may mm. have a significance to you. It may not have a significance to you. So mm. I don't know if you've ever seen um, a Somali... I, I, I understand you're from a Bangladeshi background, right? Yes. So I don't know if you've ever seen Somali writing in, in a newspaper. It may have English um, letters. Mm. However, the, those things have no significance to you, even if you can read it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because it's not actually your language. Mm. So there are people who do understand English within the deaf community. However, their English uh, is no way near like mm. for example hours on average we're speaking and the average school leaver leaves with a literacy age of in and around nine years old mm. it's uh, it's a to to even think of british sign language as a uh, we say the word british and we think english uh, immediately but but it's it's a jazakallah khair you really um inform myself uh in in thinking that it is a separate language and to even uh, think about reading in English. It's as if it is reading in a foreign language to them because the you know the school school system education system here is English. It is not the primary language of uh, of someone who's from the deaf community, which would be a much more visual language. 
And I, speaking about the idea of English translations or English works, um, or even whether it's English or Arabic or even uh, Bangla, um, what resources are there uh, for the uh, deaf Muslims in, in general? And then inshallah we can go uh, a little bit into the specifics of Alishara. So, um, sadly, uh, the resources available to the deaf community, we're talking about Islamic resources, right? Yes. Or general. Islamic uh, resources. Um, yeah. Uh, Islamic resources generally, um, it's in its, in its, it's in its, its, its stage of infancy. Mm. So, up until we published Surah Fatiha, which was uh, around two and a half years ago, there wasn't an approved method in how deaf people can actually even recite Surah Fatiha. Um, we have yeah. pockets of people trying to do certain things, mm. but we don't have very many approved words that have gone through rigorous scholarly checking to say, here you are, here's a resource. So for example, you and I as English speakers or mm. the general Muslim uh, may ha have access to English translation of, of books, of hadith, of Quran, of how to make wudu, how to do salah, what to recite. Even if we don't, if, even if we can't access it in Arabic, we have transliterations which help us. Mm. Uh, and all of these things, there's, a, a, there's extensive resources. Whereas just to go back for a deaf person, I mean, even the Quran is not there. Mm. Hadith is very far from the picture. We're working to produce um, work such as how does a deaf person make wudu? How does a deaf person, what's the process of salah for a deaf person? Mm. Uh, we have, so we're, obviously, uh, generally speaking, the, the resources out there are very few and far between. Mm. SubhanAllah. And um, what, if, if you can give us a little bit about, uh, we've already started, we've spoken about Al Ishara uh, a few times, the organization that, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, that, that you're with, I, I say you're with, but um, you're one of the um, uh, project managers but, uh, as well as the, uh, uh, um, are you also the director of Al Ishara as well? I'm the head of operations. Head of operations. Head of operations. Head of operations. Sorry, um, all these titles just get confused in my head. <laughs> um, so, um, if if you can uh, tell us what, um, a bit ba bit of background about Al Ishara, why it was set up, uh, where it is, um, and, and w w what you're working on, and what services you're providing, just so that the uh, our audience can can know um, how we can um, better, I guess be informed about the work that's going on and how we can also try and contribute. Sure. So Alishara was set up as a result of, uh, by a deaf brother named Sadaqat Ali. And that was mm. set up as a result of a, a parent of a deaf child who would come to him and he said, look, I have this deaf child. I have nobody to teach them about Islam, not even the basics of Islam. And as a result of that, Alishara was, um, started mm. uh, and since our inception back in 2007 8 um we've alhamdulillah tried to grow from strength to strength our mentality has been um when a person has a has a deaf child we want mm. to be able to support them from the very onset all the way up to later on in life and for those reasons we've set up a number of um services so as we said um, earlier, the difficulty that um, Muslim parents face thinking, how will my child access Islam? How will they say their shahada? How will they learn their du'as? How will they be able to recite Quran? So one of the very first things that Ali Shara done was set up a Ali Shara weekend Islamic school. And that catered for both children who were deaf and hard of hearing. So children mm. were taught using two distinct methods. One was through British Sign Language, and one was through um, or through an oral method using speech and language mm. uh, therapy techniques and things like that. Um, ever since we've grown our services now um, to, alhamdulillah, uh, operate in a number of places, um, and I'll go through them with you. We now offer um, classes for adults in British Sign Language. We offer sister circles. We provide monthly lectures. 
Um, we make Islam accessible on a weekly basis by interpreting the khutbah. Mm. Um, we provide um, deaf trips, uh, events, and just overall inclusion. And, and obviously, one of the key things that we provide, as mentioned, was the translation of the Quran, which is also, you may find it available on our website or on YouTube. Um, so a number of services now exist for the deaf community where they can go and basically assume a strong deaf identity, a Muslim mm. deaf identity. Recently, we had somebody who came to us and uh, they wanted to take the Shahada. One mm. of the ways that we were able to do that, Alhamdulillah, interpret the information. Mm. And he was able to declare his Shahada in British Sign Language. Okay, so slowly but surely, mm. uh, the community is growing. And as much as uh, a situation being quite bleak mm. uh, and you're saying it, it can be disheartening at the same time it's actually an opportunity of good for us yes so when you're there you know one day we like to imagine one of the things that we talk about when we're with the team is we say one day there'll be future Muslim, uh, deaf muslims who will say there were some there were some people in the past that helped mm. us provide these resources and now we have access to x y and z and because mm. of them now alhamdulillah we can assume strong Muslim deaf identity. Mm. MashaAllah. So how can we find uh, your organization and um, how can we support it in this, uh, as you mentioned, this really uh, massive opportunity? Um, yep. Yeah. So prior to the pandemic, as you know, the pandemic's changed everything for everybody. Mm. Um, it's been a blessing in disguise for many of us as well. Um, prior to the pandemic, our school operated in uh, three different locations, in Redbridge, in Tar Hamlets, and in Luton. Now, mm. alhamdulillah, we have uh, classes orientated for those people, but we also have uh, our services for children available everywhere. Mm. Our website is www.alishara.com or just Google us, alishara.com. Um, and you'll find us there. We have a host of services that um, the community can get involved in supporting. There's a number of ways you can support us. Number one, we ask you to ask Allah to help us. Make dua for us. And so our services can continue. Number two, um, we work in a specialist niche area, which means we have to hire um, trained personnel, skilled personnel who have... Um, who are very expensive effectively mm. and one of the ways that you can support our organization is by donating to our causes and you can mm -hmm. do that through our website uh okay. number three if you're interested in volunteering with us mm. contact us um through our website and inshallah we'll be in touch with you as well okay jazakallah khair uh, brother azad um uh, we just come to the end of our program and uh, it, it, it was a really informative um hour with yourself and um, inshallah, uh, I will try my best to support your work. Uh, and uh, inshallah, uh, you know, we'll all make dua uh, for the um, for the barakah in, in the work that you do and for the um, success of the organization. And I just want to thank you once more for accepting uh, my invitation to uh, talk on the show. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.